Zombies. You can't live with them, and they can't live at all. At least they won't if you're doing it right. Zombies have been a staple of gaming culture since the early days of the industry, and even prior to that in other forms, ranging from literature to movies to spoken folklore. Because of this prevalence, zombies have become almost a trope of the gaming industry. In the light of their thematic success, however, the creature would steadily fall into trope status and take itself into a rut over the past decade. With most titles steadily falling into obscurity post-release or being panned by critics and players alike, the idea of the zombie game, so to speak, was simply dead until the start of our now very current revival. To cover all this, I'd like to take some time to discuss the history of zombie games, how they evolved over time, and some of my favorite zombie titles, both new and old, that have broken the mold and managed to set and reset the standard over the years. Strap in, boyos, because we're coming out of this one brain dead! Woo! If we're going to talk about the history of zombie games, we have to start with the birth of the modern zombie, not just in video games, but in general pop culture. Zombies shown in some of our favorite movies and games have deep roots in Haitian folklore and the voodoo religion, potentially becoming so through the trade of enslaved Africans to Haiti. It's said that these enslaved people held the belief that, should they somehow offend the deity Baron Samedi, they would live eternally as a zombie, permanently enslaved instead of being brought to the afterlife. The key distinction to be made here is that these zombies aren't born of pathogens or experimentation, but of voodoo magic, and essentially function as brainwashed humans rather than the mindless killing machines we know now. This differs significantly from our modern depictions of zombies, obviously. So how does this depiction of the undead born of magic eventually become the unstoppable hordes of disease that we know today? The transformation technically starts with the works of horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote several novellae on the subject of the undead. Most notably among them is Herbert West Reanimator, which set a new standard for the vicious concept of the undead that we know today. Lovecraft was a racist piece of dog shit, but at the very least left behind a bunch of really good writings before dying like any good asshole should. From there, other authors like Richard Matheson and the people behind EC Comics would go on to feature this new zombie standard in their works including I Am Legend, no, not that one, the other one, yeah, that one, and Weird Science, respectively. These works, either in their present form or through some adaptation, such as I Am Legend being adapted into Vincent Price's The Last Man on Earth, will lead to the now famous George Romero's production of Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead, though produced on a budget of just $114,000, would go on to be one of the most successful zombie movies ever made, and popularize this concept of the undead to mass audiences. Fun fact, Romero used the brainless hordes of zombies as a stand-in for the racist ideology of the South in the 1960s. It's good to know that the work done by a racist prick from the 30s was turned into a progressive story about racial injustice in the 60s. Fuck you, H.P. Lovecraft. With the popular idea of zombies now commonplace in popular culture, zombie films remained particularly strong in the West throughout the 70s and 80s. With the birth of video games running parallel to this phenomenon, it was only a matter of time before the two came together in some grand correspondence. This grand correspondence was the Quicksilver-produced game Zombie Zombie. Maybe grand was too strong a word. Zombie Zombie was a ZX Spectrum computer game released in Europe and nowhere else thank god, in 1984. The general premise of the game was to use a helicopter to lead zombies up tall geometric buildings and guide them off the edge for points. You really can't make this shit up, can you? Zombie Zombie is not only the first game of the style released by Quicksilver, it's also a sequel to the thematically unrelated title known as Ant Attack, which was basically the same fucking thing just with ants. Look at this shit, man. This is... This shit is just pathetic. Regardless of how anticlimactic the nature of this game may be, it is, in fact, credited as the first video game to prominently feature zombies as the main antagonist. While other games like Entombed, The Evil Dead, and Ghosts and Goblins all featured zombies in some form, none of them are credited with the concept of being zombie games. <laughs> Super zombies will go on to be featured in games ranging from Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Alone in the Dark 3 to early entries of the Doom series, each appearance taking on a slightly different form. While appearances of zombies across titles kept the idea of the flagship monster alive, it wasn't until 1996 that gaming saw two of its biggest players in the zombie game genre, House of the Dead and Resident Evil. It's at this point that I feel we can divide zombie games into two applicable genres, survival horror and action action arcade, each being piloted by Resident Evil and House of the Dead respectively. On the survival horror side of things, Resident Evil took the world by storm, showing how effective a proper setting and puzzle resource management gameplay can be to create the feeling of sheer terror. I mean, look at this cutscene you get not 15 minutes into the actual game. If that doesn't set the scene for you, nothing will. The fixed camera angles, limited resources, and nearly indestructible lumbering dead that could be around any corner revolutionized the capability of zombies to be as good as any other horror icon. Gone were the days of Ghosts and Goblins and Doom, when zombies were as easy to kill as mosquitoes, relegated to the lowest tier of cannon fodder imaginable. Now, the zombie is a truly formidable foe that takes skill and planning to overcome one way or another. This rebirth of the zombie remains relatively popular across survival horror-esque titles like the Half-Life and Dead Rising series, but with its own thematic changes from title to title. Even Resident Evil has played with its own concept of zombies from game to game, like the Las Plagas infected from Resident Evil 4 or the Molded from Resident Evil 7. Regardless of their appearance or difference of function, these permutations of the classic gaming zombie have allowed the classic appearance to live on over the years and given it the chance to be classically revived with remakes of games like Resident Evil 2 or Resident Evil 3. On the opposite side of the spectrum is House of the Dead in the action-action arcade genre. While Resident Evil focused on making the zombies a recognizable figure in the world of horror by making them strong enough to be feared, House of the Dead instead gave zombies a much-needed ability check. 
That is, it created the fast zombie. By pairing zombies that can now run and pose a vastly more significant threat with fast-paced light gun gameplay, House of the Dead gave utility to the zombie, ultimately making them a much more substantial foe in the world of arcade gaming. This development in the formulation of the zombie has led to countless titles that use the runner format. This includes, but is not limited to, Left 4 Dead 1, Left 4 Dead 2, Call of Duty Nazi Zombies in all of its forms, Dead Nation, Red Dead Redemption Undead Nightmare, Dead Island, Dying Light, and Sniper Elite Zombie Army. If you can't tell, arcade zombie games are vastly more common than their survival horror counterparts. House of the Dead's reinvention of the zombie completely changed the course of zombie games and ultimately put us on a course to see countless titles with the sprinting hordes that terrifies with their sheer mass and ferocity. If you didn't know, we can thank House of the Dead for appearances of zombies in films like 28 Days Later, which used the running zombie design to distinguish themselves from zombie movies of the 70s and 80s. Additionally, 28 Days Later is one of several films credited with reviving the zombie movie concept, so technically speaking, House of the Dead saved both arcade-style gaming and part of the horror movie industry. It isn't often that video games influence other media this way, so seeing such a classic title change the way pop culture as a whole sees the undead is unbelievably cool. Unfortunately, even though these titles managed to give a new kind of credence to the idea of zombie-focused gaming, they couldn't keep that motivation alive. Quality and quantity of zombie games dropped off severely starting in 2009, in a period that I refer to as the drop-off. Games like Dead Island in 2011 and DayZ in 2012 suffered from poor development, glitches, uninteresting stories, or became outright unplayable in certain instances. As some of the biggest titles that come out of this period, their floundering led to the further exacerbation of public disinterest in zombie games, something that had naturally formed due to a severe oversaturation of releases between 2006 and 2010. Even the series that built the genre up couldn't manage to keep themselves away from the fatigue that plagued the genre at this time. Resident Evil failed back to back with RE5 and RE6, two of the worst rated games in the series in 2009 and 2012 respectively, and House of the Dead ceased to exist in 2013 after the release of Typing of the Dead for PC. This period of drop-off essentially killed the modern zombie gaming scene, and all seemed lost for a time. Even today, the number of zombie games published across all platforms is significantly lower than it once was, and the quality therein still fails to refire that once known excitement we felt in an overwhelming majority of cases. However, not all is lost. 2013 brought about a significant shift in zombie game development news with the initial release of Seven Days to Die and Naughty Dog's now famous The Last of Us. Seven Days to Die brought back the arcade feel of zombie titles with a sandbox building survival game that, while still not complete to this day, stands as one of the best options for a zombie game in this form. The complex inner workings of the title are rewarding and interesting, and the hidden story of the world told in notes scattered across the landscapes, while simple, is of better quality than most finished zombie games these days. At the same time, Naughty Dog's The Last of Us was just... Wow. The Last of Us showed the world so much all at one time. It told us that the story of a zombie game can be palpable and relatable rather than over the top and silly. It told us that survival horror gameplay is alive and well when it's placed in the right hands. It showed us that even the zombies themselves, a now tired and substandard trope of so many larger genres, still have room for improvement and intrigue, something that was expanded on even more in The Last of Us 2. I remember the fight with the Rat King. Fuck that creepy thing. In short, 2013 marked a very key point in the development of zombie games. The beginning of of the revival. The market hasn't fully recovered from the saturation it saw in years prior, but gems continue to be produced on and off every year, showing a steadily healing interest and creativity within the genre. To name a couple additional examples, The Evil Within in 2014 and The Evil Within 2 in 2017, Dying Light in 2015 and its planned sequel, most likely coming in 2022 or 2023, Killing Floor 2 in 2016, Resident Evil 7 in 2017, notably the game that brought back the survival horror Resident Evil from past decades, Metal Gear Survive in 28, just kidding, that game was hot shit, 28 gave us The Walking Dead the final season, and finally, 2019 and 2020 respectively brought us the remakes of Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3. While some of these games are clearly not works of high art, the upward trend in the production value and respect for the art of making zombie games gives me the strong, overwhelming hope that zombie games can and will return as a prominent genre in the field of game development. So, zombie games clearly interest the hell out of me. I've loved playing them since I was a kid, and with no shortage of them to enjoy, I have a whole ass list of favorites to discuss. I won't make you sit through all that shit though, so uh, here's like five of them in no particular order. I don't fucking know man, it's my show, I'll do what the fuck I want. Obviously, if you've spent more than two minutes on this channel, you already know that I have a deep, long-standing love of the Left 4 Dead series. I've made two other videos on it for fuck's sake, what more could I possibly say? Considering that I've already alluded to a lot of what I think about this series in those videos, in an attempt to not overburden the point, uh, I'm gonna 
to try to keep this short. In voicing over this in post, I realized that is a complete lie. Both games in the Left 4 Dead series follow a group of four survivors attempting to escape the dangers of the apocalyptic collapse of society following a massive scale pandemic as they make their way back to their human counterparts and the safe zones they've made in as few pieces as possible. Our four, or technically eight, survivors have been lucky enough to carry immunity to the virus that would otherwise eradicate them, though through their contact with other humans over the course of their exfiltration, we realize that their immunity makes them carriers of the virus, infecting those around them. This is a major inciting theme of the series that results in a lot of thematic similarities between the games, but also enriches the story by making these characters both the saviors and harbingers of doom for humanity, which I think is a very interesting catch-22 to deal with as a player. Left 4 Dead 1, which I will simply be calling Left 4 Dead, was released in 2008 and follows the premiere of War characters Zoe, Francis, Bill, and Lewis. Two weeks after the first instance of a new virus known as Green Flu began to rip through the population of Pennsylvania and make its way across the country, the four survivors are corralled together by the special infected. After flagging down a helicopter pilot flying overhead, they're told to make their way to the nearby Mercy Hospital for evacuation to start their long journey to Georgia's fabled safe zone. Each campaign of Left 4 Dead tells a different part of the story of their journey from Pennsylvania to Georgia, ranging from the Mercy Hospital evacuation to the Dead Air C-130 escape, all the way to their alternative goal of the Florida Keys once they realize that the majority of Georgia has gone up in flames. The story of these four survivors comes to a conclusion when Bill sacrifices himself to the Horde to reactivate a dead generator and allow the rest of the survivors to escape on a lift bridge that would take them to the safety of a boat headed for the Florida Keys. Left 4 Dead 2 was released in 2009 and follows a separate collection of survivors, Coach, Ellis, Nick, and Rochelle. These survivors start out in Savannah, Georgia, and must head from there to a safe zone they've heard remains standing in New Orleans. Much like in the original Left 4 Dead, the survivors steadily make their way to their final destination, realizing that the infection seems to follow them wherever they go. In the end, they make it to the same roadblock as the survivors from the first game, the suspension bridge upon which the original survivors are now trapped. In exchange for assistance in getting them to the other side of the bridge, the original survivors promise to lower the bridge after they cross to allow the new gang to continue towards New Orleans. These two storylines, while often thematically similar, are carried on by an individually strong because of a few major factors. One, their differing characters. Two, the additional content introduced into Left 4 Dead 2. And three, the vastly differing and varied set pieces of the two stories. The characters between the two titles all have their own different stories and personalities that come out through some remarkably candid conversations, usually occurring during the beginning of campaigns while you're still in the safe room. This method of introducing the characters and having them interact with one another makes them feel substantially more relatable and is a more valid way to further the lore of the series when a full-blown story is generally absent from the player experience. Between Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2, these conversations become a vastly more developed part of the game, occurring with greater frequency and detail, likely because of the additional lore that Valve had built up since developing the first game. These conversations are just one of the many different additions made to Left 4 Dead 2 that expanded upon the functionality and expanse of the game. In addition to the supplementary world-building elements, Left 4 Dead 2 brought new guns, new special infected types, a whole new class of infected known as uncommon infected, and whole new maps and themes to rely on. The additional content that the game is composed of is essentially why Left 4 Dead 2 was made in the first place. Developers, in an interview with Kotaku, stated that the ideas they had created to include in Left 4 Dead expanded beyond the reach that the initial release could handle, and a new start was required to pack it all together in the end. This was actually a super contentious point for critics and fans alike prior to the release of Left 4 Dead 2, as players felt cheated assuming that Left 4 Dead would be abandoned in favor of its younger brother. This obviously wasn't the case, thankfully, and Valve continued to develop content for both games, eventually linking them together with the Passing and the Sacrifice campaigns. These campaigns and the original ones produced for Left 4 Dead 2 are, notably, the biggest difference between the two titles. While Left 4 Dead focuses heavily on a sort of fire and brimstone, dark apocalypse kind of vibe with blackened corridors, empty windows, and generally emptier surroundings, Left 4 Dead 2 has an entirely different thematic direction. As opposed to constantly dark and stormy or sickly looking world elements of the first game, Left 4 Dead 2 features substantially brighter levels in general, and the variations therein are of a much greater degree than Left 4 Dead. I think that these landscapes and the very much different themes they carry, despite being similarly violent and dilapidated, help keep the game replayable and enjoyable so many years after its original release. What's good to note here is that, should you wish to see these campaigns side by side for yourself, they were all made available in Left 4 Dead 2 through a patch at some point after the release. The thing I think I respect most about these games is that they don't try to be more than they are. You shoot zombies, there are characters that are pretty damn cool despite being basically tropes from the zombie media and there's a story that doesn't waste your time with ridiculous complexity or over-the-top spectacles. Frankly, the best way to describe it is clean, even though how gory it is, especially for its time, would suggest otherwise. Despite both of these games being over 10 years old now, I find myself coming back to them time and time again. The visuals and the gameplay hold up timelessly, and with the Steam Workshop there to tailor the experience to your individual tastes with maps and mod 
Bloods galore, the game is basically endlessly replayable. Factor in the special game modes like survival mode, last man on earth, and the versus modes, and you have an infinite amount of content to enjoy. That content actually expands beyond the Left 4 Dead franchise as well, if you didn't know. If you're a fan of the Payday series of games, you know that a mission themed after the No Mercy campaign was developed for both titles in that series. It's notably non-canon, but even then it's something to enjoy if you want a different look at the story of Left 4 Dead. Now, while it would most likely happen, I would personally love a third installment in the series. Apparently, one was being worked on prior to the development of the Source 2 engine, Valve, and was scrapped largely because 1. Turtle Rock Studios, the original developers of Left 4 Dead, were no longer working with Valve at the time, and 2. Without the Source 2 engine, only so much work could be done without losing everything to an engine change. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, slow your roll. Who the fuck is Turtle Rock Studios? Quick aside here, since I haven't really mentioned them much, Turtle Rock Studios is the game development team that started the production of Left 4 Dead. Eventually, after a release date was announced for the title, it was acquired by Valve both due to the nature of the game and Turtle Rock's previous engagements with them. From my research, it appears that Turtle Rock ceased to be involved with the production of the Left 4 Dead series after the IP was sold to Valve. So, really, we have Turtle Turtle Rock to thank for the Left 4 Dead series, and if you're a fan like me, they've announced a spiritual successor to the franchise called Back for Blood that will be available in June of 2021. From some of the early access gameplay I've seen and the promotional materials for the game, I'm gonna say it's probably gonna be fucking sick, and you should definitely keep your eye on it. Until then, if you need me, I'm gonna keep playing Dead Center over and over again until I can build the damn thing from memory in Minecraft. Works more than well enough for me. Alright, I'll make the distinction. I know that it's no longer called Nazi Zombies. Technically, yeah, it's Call of Duty Zombies. All of us OGs though, we know the truth. This shit is Nazi zombies. So let me set the stage for you. You're 13 years old and it's 1030 at night on a Saturday. You've just finished shooting your way through Berlin, surviving a gunshot wound in the process and in glorious communistic fashion you cut down the flag at the Third Reich and plant that glorious red and gold beacon of sheer fucking willpower in its place. The credits have rolled and they come to a close. But there's more. Suddenly, you're blasted with this cutscene completely out of nowhere. Your plane has gone down, you're injured, the enemy is closing in, and above all else, something is very, very wrong. The shadow running at you from the distance closes in on you, and then BAM! Nazi zombies. That shit blew my mind as a kid. So aside from the fact that Call of Duty World of War is just a really damn good World War II game, and arguably one of the best games of the franchise itself, it gave birth to one of the best mini games ever, and it might as well be considered its own game at this point thanks to the limitless expansion it's undergone over the years. If you didn't already know, Nazi Zombies was actually never supposed to happen. Developers at Treyarch, while working on World at War, slowly and steadily started to play with bits and pieces of the game's assets, and one department after another came together to create what we now know as the famous Zombies mode. Essentially, the story goes that animators and scripters started to play with the animation for flamethrower enemies, which became the shambling zombie animation we see throughout the series now which was built upon by the Treyarch dev team piece by piece until it was eventually pitched to their publisher, Activision, who included it in the game, sans marketing or public display. All that basically means that Treyarch made this whole new piece of COD content that had never been seen before, and Activision was like, all right, we'll give it a try but we're not gonna give a shit about it. At least that's more or less how Jason Blundell, the director of Zombies at Treyarch, describes it. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I think you get the gist. The end result was a massively successful co-op Easter egg boat that took the world by storm and proved that, despite the strict timelines they faced, Treyarch could create something of their own that would please even the most die-hard Call of Duty fan. Now, 13 years later, players have the Zombies mode of Black Ops Cold War in our midst, and I think we're enjoying it? I don't know, I thought it was pretty okay. Regardless of how you feel about how the concept of zombies has evolved within Call of Duty itself, it's undeniable that the wave-based survival mode was truly one of perfect simplicity. It was best when it didn't take itself too seriously and just let you rock and roll with countless rounds of ammunition and three buddies to revive you once you got cocky and tried to use a PhD flopper as your only weapon. Don't give me that look, I know you've tried it. Simultaneously, the fact that these bonus mode maps have steadily formed their own storyline through various easter eggs hidden therein is perfect for those of us who love a good sci-fi action story. By including these hidden pieces of the puzzle throughout the maps of the original four expansions and on into Black Ops and later titles, Treyarch fashioned something different from anything else on the market for the dedicated players who really wanted to know everything. Now, the story is way too big and frankly way too confusing to discuss here, so I'm just gonna put up this screenshot at the timeline and let you guys go ham with that. Hold on, wait a minute, no that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't that go before that? What the fuck is the dark ether? What the fuck am I looking at? Now, I'll admit, I have some very strong negative opinions about damn near everything that takes place in this story from like 
Black Ops 2 on, but that's a story for another video entirely. Despite those feelings, I have never been and will never be one to turn down the controller when zombies is on the screen. Some of my best memories of gaming with friends come out of my experiences with zombies, and I'm sure it's the same for countless people out there too. On top of all this, especially for PC gamers, Nazi Zombies is super easy to mod and make your own thanks to a set of developer tools released to us by Treyarch. Thanks to that toolkit, World at War is still kicking strong with custom zombies maps of all kinds to enjoy, from challenge and puzzle maps to story and narrative maps that are way more well produced than they have any right to be. If you somehow managed to miss this milestone of zombie game history, you'd be doing yourself an honor by going back in time and giving it a shot. You will not be let down. Resident Evil 4 holds a really special place in my games library, not only as the first Resident Evil game I ever played, but the first M-rated game I'd ever played. Resident Evil 4 is, as you probably guessed, the sixth major release in the Resident Evil series developed by Capcom, assuming you don't count the spin-offs in the 2002 remake of the first game. Resident Evil 4 also marks the reinvention of the series with a completely revised gameplay style and significant changes to the standard RE storyline, from the setting to the enemies and even to the virus itself. These departures are developments that ended up informing the direction of both Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil Evil 6 before the eventual return to the standards of the series with various remasters and remakes of older titles. All of this just goes to say that Resident Evil 4 is a pretty damn important turning point for the series, and kind of the thing that led to the failing of the series. I'll come back to that point later. The story of RE4 takes place six years after the Raccoon City outbreak shown to us in Resident Evil 2. Leon has moved up from an average beat cop to a US special agent, and has been tasked with traveling to a remote village somewhere in Spain to rescue the president's daughter, Ashley, from a cult known as Los Illuminados. While the whole deal seems like a relatively standard ransom demand at first, things very quickly spiral into the unnatural and downright horrific. Leon steadily discovers through the assistance of his newfound partner Luis and the return of the ever-famous Ada Wong that the Los Illuminatus cult is anything but normal. The leader of this cult, Osmond Sadler, has taken control of the local population using a parasite known as Las Plagas, essentially creating a small army out of humans and various beasts alike, while making some seriously badass looking bosses along the way, I'll give him that. His intention was to kidnap the president's daughter, infect her with the parasite, and use that control to infect the president and begin his takeover of the world. Leon and Ashley, both now infected and resisting the growth and control of the parasite, have no choice but to fight their way out of this fresh hell and rid the world of the parasite before all hope is lost. Generally speaking, the story of Resident Evil 4 is one of the best in the series. The natural and witty writing given to Leon keeps dialogue and cutscenes interesting, and the interaction we witness between Leon and Ashley, as well as the greater cast of allies and enemies, is enthralling and detailed. I mean, tell me you didn't immediately know how awesome Leon was going to be in this game after hearing this one-liner no more than like half an hour into the game. Where's everyone going? Bingo. See? It like that made this game unique. The writing for the Resident Evil games had never been considered as of outstanding quality, especially when we talk about the first couple titles for the original PlayStation. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a jewel sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Yep, that is exactly how far we've come in a matter of nine years. That is a substantial improvement. This new, more fresh, pseudo-natural style of writing meant that the game felt somehow more real, yet also more hyperbolic. This allowed the game to carefully skirt that line between bland and outright ludicrous, something that Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil 6 just couldn't pull off. This quality increase in writing and voice acting was accompanied by a substantially renewed story that removed the concept of a standard bioweapon like the T-Virus and gave the developers more room to play with the kinds of enemies they'd be throwing at the player. By transitioning the main focus of the game from the T-Virus to Las Plagas, the primary enemies and conflict of the story receive a much needed refresher. While there are certainly similarities to maintain some semblance of what players expected from a Resident Evil game, like some of the standard cannon fodder enemies, Las Plagas was positioned as a completely different entity from the T-Virus and had a completely different set of rules. Rather than perverting humans into monsters, like in earlier titles, the parasite takes over the human, eventually being capable of not only controlling, but growing out of the host and causing some serious damage. Uh, that is... Awful. Jesus Christ. With a completely new style and conflict, RE4 brought a new life to the series as a whole, and this new life is largely the reason why RE4 stands as such a memorable and loved title today. Outside of the more complex and modified story, gameplay saw a major revitalization through the implementation of an over-the-shoulder camera. While previous games in the series relied on fixed cinematic cameras and what are often referred to as tank controls, RE4 sought to distinguish itself from the rest of the series by giving players an entirely new way to experience the horrors the developers would set upon them. The camera now follows Leon in third person, 
can be adjusted to glance around in different directions and incorporates a Titan shoulder view for aiming. According to one of the creative directors of the game, this change came about after he had played Resident Evil Zero and felt extremely unimpressed with the old system that now felt clunky and unrefined. While that same thing can be said for RE4's control scheme now, it's certainly an improvement over the design of the old days and was a key stepping stone in getting us to the smooth and responsive gameplay of the RE2 and RE3 remakes. Obviously, all of this is most likely old news to you. The game's been out since 2005 and has been ported for consoles as new as the PS4. It's not like this game just somehow fell into obscurity between then and now. What you might actually not know, though, is that RE4 went through three different versions during its development, all of which were completely different from what we got today. These three versions all featured different story arcs, environments, and enemies, with the only real common throughline being Leon is the protagonist. Some of these versions were developed extensively before being scrapped, and ultimately were salvaged for parts to complete the version of the game that we know now. Each of these preliminary versions had its own nickname. One, the Fog version. Two, the Hookman version. And three, the hallucination version. Elements like the over-the-shoulder camera, quick-time events, and other gameplay bits and bobs were ripped from each of these versions and put together to form the final version that we ended up getting today. In fact, actually, one of these original versions was scheduled to be about the progenerator virus that now appears in Resident Evil 5. I mean, who wouldn't know? Well, actually, I guess the developers would have known, and maybe that's why Resident Evil got so confused for a while there. You see, for how much I personally praise RE4 for being one of the best survival horror and Resident Evil games, I also have to admit that a large portion of the thematic changes it made to the production of the story that it stems from may have resulted in the failures that are Resident Evil 5 and 6. The movement towards more action-oriented gameplay distracted too much from the underlying horror that was so crucial to the game in the first place. By continuing to move not only towards this new style of gameplay, but to also continue leading into the sillier side of RE4's writing, future entries just couldn't cut it, especially when they needed to be serious. For your consideration... <laughs> This is obviously all conjecture, but I think you see my point. All told, Resident Evil 4, at least until the release of Resident Evil 7, was the best and most influential game in the series. I remember being in high school and fawning over the re, uh, the HD remaster that was released in 2014. I got nerded out for a whole day by getting to go home and see the horror of my childhood plastered across the screen in glorious HD resolution. I hadn't considered at the time that the Dell laptop I was playing games on couldn't handle it all that well, but still, I had a good time with it. On top of that, many nights in my freshman year in college were actually spent revisiting the game, going through and like hunting down all the bonuses and stuff. There were many a night that I stayed up way too late for my own good for way too many nights in a row just to beat the game. Speaking of remasters, I want to discuss the possibility of getting a Resident Evil 4 remake in the coming future. A little while back, I actually made a short standalone video about this, but I kind of hate that one now, so here feels like a more valid place to mention this. The newest entry in the series is going to be Resident Evil Village, said to be released on May 7th of 2021. This game appears to both be a direct sequel to Resident Evil 7 and also a spiritual successor to Resident Evil 4, featuring elements like the village setting, a, a similar inventory system, and even a weapons merchant they called the Duke. With this combination of information tells me is that Capcom is not only aware of the continued interest in Resident Evil 4 and a potential remake thereof, but is also willing to work with elements of the game in new titles, possibly to test the waters for functionality if it were to ever be applied in a remake. Again, purely conjecture, solely speculation, basically outright guessing on my gut feelings. Regardless, if there was ever a PlayStation 2 or GameCube era game to pay for and revisit today, it would be this gem of survival horror. Oh man, I cannot tell you how long I've waited to talk about this series in a video. Killing Floor was introduced to me back in high school and instantly became my go-to shoot 'em up game for time wasting and hanging out with friends alike. I am very excited for this part. The original Killing Floor was actually a mod for Unreal Tournament 2004 that was released in 2005. The final version of this mod featured not only the standard wave-based combat that the series is now known for, but also a single-player campaign in the style of the usual first-person shooters of the day, like Quake or Doom. As janky as it may have been at the time, the total conversion was a massive success, leading to triple Wire Interactive, the company behind Heroes of Stalingrad, asking the mod's developer Alex Quick to sell them the rights and give it a standalone AAA release. As it would happen, uh, he said no. Eventually, as the mod got older and older and players began to lose interest, Alex reopened negotiations with Tripwire and BAM! Killing Floor was released as a standalone title on a modified version of the Unreal Engine in 2009. The game looks prettier, plays smoother, sounds crisper, and has way more content in it than its modded version older brother, even with what you could consider as a light launch. What I think is really notable about this AAA release is that its development took a whopping three months and had roughly ten people working on it. How is that possible? How does a whole ass game be developed in three months with ten people working on it. What the fuck? I feel really shitty for only getting like one video done per month now. God 
damn. No matter how they did it, the game was made and, as I've been told, became the top seller on Steam for a time after its release. Players loved the macabre, dark air of the game and the consistent carnage of the gameplay, leading to a game that still sees a fair amount of play to this day. It's at this point that the underlying plot of the game needs to be brought up. Orsine Biotech is a biological research company based in London that has been tasked with the study of cloning and genetic manipulation. While this goes well at first, the cloning specimens steadily grow more grotesque in appearance and violent in behavior. The operation eventually reaches its breaking point, the specimens escaping their containment, wiping out the science and security teams in the facility, and eventually breaking out into the city and beginning an overwhelming attack on civilians everywhere. In an attempt to keep the outbreak from becoming a colossal worldwide event, the English Special Forces tasks a handful of former Special Forces members, police recruits, really anyone that they can get their hands on, and commands them to eradicate as many Zeds as they call them as possible. It's pretty simple frankly, but that's really all that it needs to be. In reality, this story isn't harped on almost at all in the gameplay, it just sets up the world in which the game is set more than anything else. Technically, the closest thing that we get to a story mode in the 2009 release is the objective modes, where players can play a handful of maps where they both fight off the Zeds and complete miscellaneous tasks. There aren't really any story assets therein though. A again, the gameplay is emphasized over everything else here. So if the gameplay is so prominently focused on, how is it? Well, let me tell you it- yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. For a game from 2009 based on the Unreal Engine, Killing Floor is about as bog standard as a first person shooter can get. The gameplay at its core is relatively safe gun and melee combat, something that is fun on its own but could get tiresome quite quickly. To combat this, Tripwire, the geniuses that they are, implemented a couple very specific features to keep things moving along and fun. These include 1. Zed variants, 2. Ludicrous weapons, 3. Built-in class systems, and for gore. So let's work our way down that list. Most zombie games suffer a pretty lame cast of enemies. There's only so many cookie cutter zombies I can kill before my stupid lizard brain goes, all right, we're done here, and decides to go beat off in the corner or something. This is remedied with a lineup of visually and functionally distinct and interesting monsters that pose different kinds of threats for different reasons. You got the husk who could fire fireballs at you with his arm cannon and blows up if you hit the tank on his back. You got the siren who will make your ears bleed with the power of opera warmups. You got the scrake who will make sushimi out of you if you get too close. You see what I'm getting at here? Tripwire through every horrific idea they could think of at the player in terrifying, mutated ways, and the diversity it created means that you've got to stay on your toes at all times. Once slip up and that's great, will sever you living from limb without one ounce of hesitation, I can tell you that for sure. Additionally, to veer further away from other zombie titles that focus on wave-based gameplay, Killing Floor games have indefinite end that comes after so many rounds have been completed. I mean, it's either that or all of the players get their asses eaten. It's dealer's choice. The end of each game comes in the form of a boss battle with the horrifying Patriarch. The Patriarch, otherwise known as Kevin Claimley, is the former CEO of Horzine Biotech turned mutant, machine gun wielding, monstrous titan that plays the role of the final boss in the first Killing Floor game. Surviving your game to the end will present you with a chance to wreck this man's shit or let him wreck yours depending on how dedicated the team you've got is. Totally, this variation from the standard Endless Wave format not only sets a goal for players, but gives them a final challenge to overcome before they can call the mission complete. It keeps the player motivated and the combat fresh. Furthermore, no matter how many enemy types there are, the fucking cannons and shit they give you to blow them away with are fucking hilarious. Tell me this, have you ever wanted to mow down a horde of zombies with a steampunk Tommy gun? What about a whale-shaped t-shirt cannon loaded with impact grenades? Okay, or maybe you prefer just a golden fucking flamethrower. Seriously, some of the shit that the Tripwire dev team came up with here is evil fucking genius, and I have to give a much much deserved tip of the hat to them. It's fucking nuts, man. You can have, essentially, any kind of weapon you want in your hands. All you gotta do is kill some Zeds for cash and trek out to a roaming trader who, between rounds, will sell you any gun you've got the money for. What's even better is that these weapons of all shapes and sizes aren't just there to fluff out your number of options or copy one another, they have actual utility in Killing Floor's perk system. So, I don't know if this is something that existed in the total conversion from 2005 or not, but in the standalone release of Killing Floor, there are seven total perk choices. These perks function as a pattern Passive buff for certain weapons, things like reload speed, magazine capacity, or weapon damage, uh, player buffs like resistance to certain kinds of damage or movement speed, and discounts on weapons or armor associated with the player's class. These classes also have XP systems where if a player completes a certain action any number of times, the perk will level up and provide better versions of the buffs it was already granting and, at higher levels, bonuses like free armor or starting guns. Both of these systems, separate and together, create a substantial amount of content for the game by both encouraging the player to work through each perk to its highest level and giving them an arsenal to do it with, something that a lot of other games like Nazi Zombies or House of the Dead didn't or couldn't do. So getting to choose a perk that suits your playstyle and pick out your favorite weapon of the bunch is awesome, but you know what makes it even cooler? Gore! Yep, Tripwire saw the grotesque and violent style of the original mod and thought, yep, 
we're going to give them what they want, and that's blood. What Tripwire essentially did was create a core system similar to that of a game called Soldier of Fortune, where limbs, torsos, basically any living part of your enemies could be ripped off if there was enough force behind the blow you hit them with. This means that whether you're taking aim for the head with a rifle or saying fuck everything in that general direction with a grenade launcher, you're going to be rewarded with a downright impressive amount of chunks for a game this old. All of this in an absolutely visceral way is scored with one of the best metal genre OSTs I have ever heard. Now, that's not to say it's as good as, say, Doom 2016 or Doom Eternal's soundtrack, but it's more than enough to get the job done. Obviously, I can't just play this music here for you now, as YouTube really wouldn't like me if I did, but I will give you an analogy to see how it feels. Remember when you beat Black Ops 2 and got that super fucking dope 3D animated music video for Carry On by Avenged Sevenfold? Menendez! What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, it's like that, but for like 30 to 45 minutes. It is a good time. And remember, all of this was available at launch. This is all stuff that they gave you day one. And then they made more! Through DLC packs and free release updates, Tripwire introduced new maps, character models, weapons, and music. Even better, some of that content was user-made content that Tripwire chose to import and make a permanent fixture in the game. Killing Floor is a perfect example of a game for the people, not for the reviewers. Generally speaking, it sits at about like a 7 to 10 most places that you look, but the opinion of actual players is significantly louder and significantly more fair to the title. That, my friends, is what made Killing Floor so great. Oh, and we're still not done here. So I mentioned that Tripwire went out of their way to make an absolute Pandora's box of content for the first game, right? The bastards went ahead and did it again! In November of 2016, after a period in early access, Tripwire released Killing Floor 2 to the masses, and oh boy is it good. So rather than repeating myself here with all the same shit that I just said, I'm just gonna say that Killing Floor 2 is Killing Floor, but with more everything. And yes, I mean everything. Except maybe maps, but that's beside the point. This means more perks, more Z types, more guns, revised perk systems, unique maps, some of which paying homage to the maps of the original game, new characters, character customization, weapon skins, player emotes, reworked multiplayer. You name it, Tripwire did it with Killing Floor 2, and they did it all in the new Unreal Engine. The shit is fantastic and plays way better than it has any right to for a hyper violent shoot em up. It's absolutely outstanding. Each one of these versions of Killing Floor is worth playing, but because there are so many titles for something that started as a fan mod and became a AAA release, there's something to be said for the thematic development of these games, and it isn't necessarily good. You see, in researching the history of Killing Floor, I realized that from version to version, the overall aesthetics of each of these games changes drastically. The total conversion from 2005 is dark as fuck, both literally and allegorically, and has a much greater focus on the horrific aspects of the Zeds than any other title. The models for Zeds, the guns, the maps, every ounce of this game's direction is dripping with the air of, this is basically a horror shooter, a la Cry of Fear. From there, we get the 2009 release, which carries a lot of the same style of grit to its designs, but to a lesser degree. Things feel sort of cleaned up in a professional manner, but still focus on the inherently dark and fucked up nature that this game world is based upon. Finally, Killing Floor 2 goes off the rails different from its two predecessors. The level of grit is dropped way down in favor of a higher level of thematic carnage. That is to basically say that instead of dirty, rusty metal walls and a kind of disturbing medical experiment vibe, you get broken out shop windows and abandoned roads with car wrecks. To put it simply, it feels a lot more like a movie zombie apocalypse than the outbreak from the past two Killing Floor games. On top of all this, Killing Floor 2 goes all in on a substantially more sci-fi aesthetic than a horror aesthetic, replacing gritty medical equipment with high-tech versions decked out with neon. Don't get me wrong, I don't think this is a bad thing at all, it's just a super serious jump from what the previous games provided, and therefore could influence your opinion of each game that you play, depending on which game you start with. No matter what though, the emphasis on murdering hundreds of botched science experiments is always there, and god damn does it feel good no matter what. No matter the thematics you choose, you're gonna have a fun time with these games, I can absolutely absolutely guarantee that. I've talked a lot so far about games that are either generally good or very personally recommendable as some of my favorites, things that we can all agree are at least playable. This last part isn't going to be that. Pre-post or mid-revitalization, not every genre will produce good games. It would be unfair to talk about anything as if it's always good all the time. That said, I wanted to introduce a game I very much wanted to love, but literally couldn't no matter how hard I tried. As I said earlier, Zombie Games experienced a drop-off that began in 2009 and was in full swing by 2011. It's in that same year that the world got one of its greatest disappointments of a zombie game. Dead Island. Dead Island takes place in 2006 on the fictional resort island of Benoit, somewhere off the coast of Papua New Guinea in Australia. The primary focus of the story is a sudden, volatile outbreak of an unknown disease that rips through the island's population, turning them all into zombies. Our four main playable characters, Sean May, Sam B, Logan Carter, and Perna, 
Wake up the day after a massive party at the Island Resort's hotel and realize that everything has gone to shit over the past eight hours. After attempting to make their way out, failing as a horde of the now brainless vacationers attempt to strike them down, the survivors are saved by a lifeguard named Cinnamoy and taken to a hideaway filled with others who have escaped death. Encounter with the infected leads to the discovery of your immunity to the virus, and now, as the only ones truly safe from the hordes outside, you must go on a long march across the island, save the survivors, uncover the mystery of the virus, find a cure, and get the fuck out of there. Honestly, a story like that may not be something that stands out much anymore or even back in 2011, but the prospect of a new zombie game that was shown to have strong thematic elements enticed a lot of people, myself included. What exactly do I mean by strong thematic elements? Let me explain. This demand for a significantly more serious or dark zombie title largely comes from the deeply emotional promotional content that Deep Silver, the people who developed that island, produced for the game's announcement. The now famous and frankly stellarly produced trailer featuring the onset of the outbreak played out in reverse from the perspective of a regular vacationing family is burned into nearly every gamer's head who saw it back in the day. Even if the visuals are a mystery to you, that slow, somber piano tune playing in the background is instantly recognizable. Damn, that actually kind of hurts to listen to. Well, this initial announcement gave us all the idea that this zombie title was going to be one of the most serious we've ever seen. The product that was delivered was not only extremely thematically different, it was also packed with issues with the gameplay, story, and just overall quality. Nearly every facet of this game could be picked over and critiqued in a not so nice light, something that is extremely emblematic of the drop off as I explained it earlier. So the plan here is to go over everything that this game did and how it was done wrong and what that meant for the zombie game genre as a whole. Strap in. I'm not going to be very nice. Firstly, that promotional material is extremely problematic in the sense that it in no way reflected the story or thematic nature of Dead Island. Initial promotional material or not, you can't just release something genuinely moving and engaging like that and then deliver something totally different. What part of that trailer's theme is translated to the final release of Dead Island? None of it. I know this may seem like a super weird thing to harp on, but let me give you a more relevant example to explain why this pisses me off so much. The Last of Us Part 2. The first trailer for The Last of Us 2 had nothing to do with the final story of the game and was not representative of the experience players got at all. It's the same thing with Dead Island. If you're going to set the expectations and you're going to set them high, you have no choice but to follow through. It is a necessity at that point. Ultimately, that is where Dead Island fails the hardest. It's theming and, as a direct result, it's story. Credit where it's due, the first act of Dead Island's story is genuinely interesting. The combination of new characters, lots of questing, a solid variety of locations to visit, and the frankly beautiful setting of a tropical island resort make a strong start for the game, especially if you're focused solely on gameplay. Even if you are focusing on the story, it's the strongest here out of any of the game's acts. Having to work with every survivor you've met so far, save others from the infected, and even find a way out of the resort and into the neighboring city brings about a lot of really fun moments and a lot of variation in characters and ideas. It starts off so interesting, and then that ends so quickly. Frame of reference, here's a synopsis. After being saved by Cinnamoy, the survivors make their way to a nearby Coast Guard tower and clear out the infected inside so that the susceptible population that still remains human can have a permanent base to exist inside. After clearing that space out and settling everyone in by completing their quests, Cinnamoy sets you on your way to find food around the resort. Quickly realizing that there just isn't enough food around to make ends meet, he sends the survivors to find an armored car that they can use to break through the blockade of abandoned ones on the road to the city and then search for supplies there. The second you set foot in the city, and that objective is over, the game is fucking done. The setting completely changes. One of the things that was so important to why the first part was so enjoyable is just gone now. The streets and alley of the city are cramped and uninteresting, and they resemble nearly every other zombie game on the market. On top of all this, despite the fact that you're here in the first place to help the survivors back at the resort, you're immediately introduced to a whole new group of people who are basically the same thing and require the same tasks to be completed, but the sole difference being you don't give a shit about these ones. Once you enter the city, any and all novelty the game had goes out the window, basically, and the formulaity of its design becomes deathly apparent. Furthermore, the story just keeps tanking on, devoid of twists or turns or substantial conflict, and ultimately flounders without a purpose. The one thing that the first trailers for this game suggested was a story worth listening to, something serious and palpable. We got nothing of the sort. What about the gameplay, though? If we step away from the writing and focus more on the player experience, how does the game hold up? Poorly. In fact, about as poorly as the story. So Dead Island does have an advantage here, and that would be the fact that it emphasizes is melee combat over gunplay, something that a lot of other first-person perspective zombie games have relied on as the basis for all of their gameplay. This focus on a less common style of combat meant that the initial moments of Dead Island were not only challenging, but also interesting, as the tech and recipe trees for enhancing and modifying your weapons opens up relatively quickly. Too quickly, in fact. Even with a relatively interesting limb targeting system that allows you to dismember your undead assailants, the novelty of this approach grows old quick when the enemies you encounter lack substantial variation and the weapons manage to control essentially identically to one another. Death is 
a moment that I realized, and likely you will too, that without the space to maneuver or, or an environment to be immersed in, nothing will be as good as the first moments you spend on the island, in or out of combat. Honestly, there's a lot more that I could discuss here, but in the interest of keeping this particular part short and to just summarize all of this in a few words, I give you this. That island had every chance to impress us with its story, gameplay, environments, mechanics, everything. Yet every single one of those facets very quickly grows stale and bears no significant difference from the content found in any other mediocre first person action game. Combine that with the game being so unstable at times, even after all the post launch patches, that crashes, graphical glitches, and performance issues stagnate any forward progress you could make, it's just dead in the water. That island is dead in the water. Altogether, the elements that Island was built on are faulty and uncompelling, leading to an absolute mess of a production that simply could not slow the steady collapse of the industry that allowed it to exist in the first place. So those were the major players I wanted to bring up in all this. For as long as it took me to get through all of those, I actually do have a couple of honorable mentions I want to bring up, just to show you how zombies and zombie-like creatures appear in other genres or uh, other game types. The first Uncharted game was one of the first two titles I played for my PS3 back in the day, and god Damn that I have a good time with it. The game has next to nothing to do with anything horror related as it's centered around a duo's hunt for El Dorado, but once it's revealed that the treasure they're searching for is cursed, the game takes quite the turn towards the horrific. Specifically, I'm thinking of this moment. Oh shit. You know, I actually think Nicky Jakey said it better than I ever could. What the fuck? The portion of this game featuring these demonic zombie-like creatures is relatively short, but genuinely scary and fun, so here we are talking about it. Funny how conversations work like that, right? The Fallout series has always been one of my favorites, specifically the 3D titles that were produced by Bethesda. Fallout 3, New Vegas, and Fallout 4 don't really contain any content themes specifically around the idea of the undead, assuming you're not counting the stretch concept that is Feral Ghouls. That said though, DLC for New Vegas, Dead Money specifically, featured the Ghost People, mutated Sierra Madre survivors binded to their hazmat suits and irreparable distorted by the toxic clouds surrounding the expansion's titular casino. While it might be a bit of a stretch to call these monsters zombie-like, their movement and theming towards melee combat forms makes them modify the gameplay experience of the expansion to be reminiscent of traditional zombie titles. Additionally, the way you have to kill them factors in somewhat, as you have to sever their limbs to keep them from getting back up to fight you again. Kind of like how you have to shoot a zombie in the head to make sure it stays down for good. To be frank, whether or not you agree with this honorable mention, this is really just me looking for a reason to talk about Fallout New Vegas. I fucking love that game. And then look at Solid 5 was a game? I'm almost certain it was a game, but really could have been a movie too. Honestly, I really like what this game did with its story and open world concept, two things that really emphasize just how properly cinematic and complex a miniature game could be in the modern day. Objectively, it's not the strongest of the titles, but it's definitely one of my personal favorites. There's certain portions of this game involving vocal parasites and the skulls division that functions on their power, zombie-like enemies become a semi-prevalent feature of encounters with XOF super soldiers, referred to as the mist unit. This team of genetically modified parasite carriers can release a mist comprised of a component known as the Metallic Archaea, which has the ability to control nearby soldiers as if they were zombies, dropping their assault weapons in favor of grappling with Snake physically. Additionally, there's a key instance where the parasite that this unit is based upon mutates while being contained at Mother Base which forces Snake to execute his own men to prevent the spread from worsening. This mutation drives the infected to sprint out into the sun and attempt to contact as many other people as possible. In essence, these moments draw on both classic and modern zombie archetypes as their primary influence and, as such, deserve an honorable mention here. I'll be completely honest, I don't really know if that was coherent or not. You've really got to play the game to understand half of what I just said, but believe me, it's worth mentioning. Flash games played a big role in my experience as a gamer when I was a little kid, and some of the best ones that I played actually were based around zombies. The first of the two that I feel like mentioning here is the SAS Zombie Assault series. This series of Flash games featured an SAS officer standing off against varied and endless hordes of infected with different types for as long as possible while upgrading their arsenal and bringing down as many corpses with them as possible. This series, as mentioned, started out as a browser-based Flash game, but has actually been ported to both mobile and PC with its fourth installment. I can't say that I recommend this one for a couple of I mean, kind of personal reasons, but if you're ever interested in a fun collection of free survival games, this one is more than good enough for an hour of fun here and there. The second Flash game I wanted to mention is Thing Thing. I have no fucking clue what a Thing Thing is, but I do know that it looks like this. Yep, I feel like that 
kind of explains it all, actually. While I'm pretty sure this isn't the case for every single game in the Thing Thing series, it's definitely the case for some that survival modes with zombies do exist. They're packed with a solid amount of 2D carnage and, I must say, hold up surprisingly well, actually. Much like with SAS Zombie Assault, this is an absolute banger and good for at least a couple good, good hours of entertainment. Back into AAA games, but veering away from action titles, plenty of RTS games like Warcraft or Warhammer have included reference to the undead in one way or another. I prefer, however, to point the finger at StarCraft II and the Outbreak mission therein specifically. Outbreak sends the player in control of a now rapidly diversifying selection of Terran Marines to the planet of Meinhof to clear out a Zerg infestation that has commandeered everything from the ground you walk to the buildings you enter and the natives that once called it home. Hope is lost for those who have already been infested with the Zerg hive mind, and the only option is to cleanse the planet before all of the survivors die off. While it may be a long shot to call the Zerg a form of zombie infestation, the effect it has on the Meinhof colonists feels very reminiscent of the giant horde scene in countless movies and other games. On top of that, this is my list! Go fuck yourself. Seriously though, I thought this was actually a really cool way to pay homage to the idea of like a zombie holdout trope that appears in a lot of other action games, but done in an RTS style. You know, I think I saw this in a movie once. It's very refreshing, not only for that same zombie holdout trope, but also for an RTS game, and it's super unique for really any kind of game done this way. Very much an enjoyable time. So, whatever form it comes to you in, zombie games have been and will continue to be a major player in gaming culture. Let's hope it just doesn't bite us in the brains later on to keep shooting for better and better hordes. And uh, there you guys have it. Yet another video. One that took me way longer for an actually good reason this time. <laughs> Hopefully you guys have enjoyed me uh, rambling on for w I'm don't know how long it'll last at this point, but what is most likely longer than any other video I have ever made. Um, this one actually took uh, a lot of effort, but for some reason was just super fun to work on, so hopefully you guys did enjoy it. If you did, please, you know, share it around with your friends, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those places. DM it to your mom or your dad. They probably won't like it, but hey, I get a view out of it. That's pretty cool. Additionally, like I said before in my update video, I'm going to try to shoot out for at least one to two videos a month. Still looking like one until, you know, the summer hits, but uh, I will do my best to keep that one video a month promise going, because so far I'm, I'm doing a good job, so who knows, maybe I'll be able to do it. <laughs> uh, that said, here is, as always, the obligatory screenshot of my uh, current work in progress folder. As always, I'm constantly working on these, they all have active scripts, so uh, we will see which one comes next. Whichever one screams to me will be in your video inbox soon enough. So again, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys really make this worth uh, worth doing. Your response to uh, my last video was amazing. I didn't think that video would do nearly as well for what it was about as it did, but you guys killed it. So thank you again, and you guys all have a dreadful day.